Welcome to Proven Improbable, where we focus on metals, mining, and more. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us for a conversation is the mercenary geologist, Mickey Fold. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thanks a lot, Maurice. Good to be here once again. Mickey, earlier this year, you gave a presentation discussing the generational shift that occurs every five to seven years with regards to new speculators in the natural resource base. Uh, this is why we're delighted to have you on our show today to share your investment thesis, which is aptly entitled The Power of Two. Now, Mickey, give us a background on how you derived this thesis, The Power of Two. Um, yeah, let's uh, go back to this uh, idea of new speculators, generational shift. Um, what I actually said was that every four to six years, we have a metal cycle, a boom and bust metal cycle. Uh, every eight to ten years, which is equal to a half generation, generation is usually thought to be 18 years. Um, you have two new groups coming in. You have another group of, let's say, 35 to 45 year olds with disposable income and uh, looking for speculative investments. Uh, plus, you have a new half generation of soon to be retirees who realize that they can't live on their Social Security checks, their 401ks, their RSPs, their IRAs, etc. So you have a two groups that come in uh, looking for more speculative investments. Um, going on to the power of two, um, I first got involved in the junior resource sector in the early 1990s. I've got about 25 years of speculating in this uh, in this junior resource market, venture capital market. And uh, the broker I had, who still is a good friend of mine and was a longtime broker of mine, um, introduced me to the idea that when a stock doubles, you sell half and take your money off the table. Um, and you go back and do it again with another stock. So that's the basis of the power of two. And Mickey, I've noticed you use the word speculating here versus investing. For the lay investor here, can you discern the difference between the two for us? Sure. An investment is something that returns uh, capital t to you on a regular basis. Uh, so, for instance, a real estate contract that you sell where you get an 8% return uh, on the debt, that's an investment. Uh, um, but the junior resource stocks and in particular and even uh, playing stocks in the market unless you're uh, collecting dividends from a blue chip is not investment it's pure speculation so you need to be prepared or you should be prepared to lose all your capital in any of these speculations now Mickey when you're looking at a junior mining company you have a selection criteria i'd like to break that down a little bit here beginning with structure what specifically are you trying to identify well for any junior resource stock i want a tight share structure uh, and it is one of the three criteria major criteria that i judge or value evaluate juniors uh, um, tight share structure, meaning uh, that insiders, family and friends uh, have skin in the game, own a significant amount of the stock. Uh, some people would refer to that as stock held in strong hands. Uh, and uh, uh, that is one of the main criteria for speculating in a junior. Now, Mickey, we hear the term stock float. Can you explain that to us, please? Yeah, stock float is generally the stock outside of what I just talked about. The, uh, let's call it held in strong hands. In other words, people that either 
uh, are not inclined to sell, they're there for the long term, or they uh, have the company's best interest in mind and the shareholders. So uh, the stock float would be the public float, the people that uh, trade, uh, the speculators, such as generally ourselves, unless you're in early on a stock. And uh, uh, so you take the total shares outstanding and you subtract everything that would be held by uh, insiders, management, family and friends, perhaps institutional funds, and that gives you what is commonly called the public stock float. And that's where most of the liquidity would, would come from. And what percentage are you looking for specifically? Um, uh, that's a, a, a very difficult question. It depends on the company, but you certainly want to find a company, let's say maybe 50% on average of the shares outstanding are in the public float. That's enough to generate good liquidity uh, because as we all know, volume in a stock is what generally causes the stock's market capitalization or share price, whichever way you want to look at it, to increase. Um, but you also want to have a significant number of shares held uh, in by people who are not inclined to sell, who are in for the longer term. Now, Mickey, you mentioned speculating earlier. You know, for someone who's new to the space, can you shed light on why there is so much volatility with junior mining companies? Yeah, because they're basically worthless. They're based on pure speculation. They have a project uh, uh, in junior resource spec or projects in which they raise equity capital and put that into the ground in an attempt to uh, uh, make the deposit larger or bigger or higher grade or whatever. Uh, but uh, they have no real value. They don't produce revenue. In fact, some people argue that the projects which they list on the left side of the balance sheet as assets are actually debits that should be uh, listed, shown on the right side of the balance sheet because uh, they use money and they generally do not return for a significant uh, number of years if they do at all. You know, most uh, about 95% of these juniors ultimately fail. Um, so uh, from that point of view, this is a very speculative uh, environment. Uh, I uh, dare you to find me a junior resource stock that in any running 52 week period does not have at least a double from its higher its low, therefore the power of two. Uh, given that idea that they all double in in, in 52 weeks or, or less from their lows, then it is incumbent on us to buy them when they're low and sell them when they double. <laughs> Very well said. Let's focus our efforts now on the people. Why is this element so crucial for listeners? Well, it is all about the people, number one. Uh, if you do not have the right people with technical backgrounds, I prefer to see the CEO of these companies, uh, the junior exploration companies run by a uh, geologist or an engineer uh, with technical know-how uh, and also with experience in the business. So uh, I tend not to put money into companies that have rookies, if you will, running them. I want to see experience and more importantly, I want to see success in the business. Uh, and success is hard to come by as we've already discussed in this business. So you're looking with people who have technical backgrounds, are experienced and successful in the junior resource sector. Uh, an entrepreneur, a so-called entrepreneur who has taken three successive companies into bankruptcy is no longer an entrepreneur in my opinion. How about the technical team? If, if I have a background in 
copper, does that make me qualified for uranium? Um, not necessarily, but uh, good geologists uh, and engineers would be experienced with a variety of um, jobs and interest in a variety of commodities. For example, you know, I've got uh, uh, 40 years in this business and uh, I've worked in most commodities that you can name off the top of your head. Uh, you know, I know a lot. I'm a generalist. I know a little to a lot about just about nearly every commodity uh, that is mined on the earth from copper to gold to uranium to oil and gas to water to limestone to sand and gravel to the rare earths etc cetera, etc cetera. well let me ask you this would you prefer a successful generalist or do you want someone that's niche specific oh i think that depends on the people uh the specific people uh certainly someone that is niche specific as you called it uh uh, for instance, uh, uh, someone that has spent his entire career exploring, uh, developing, mining copper deposits is probably uh, uh, more suited to running a copper company than he would be anything else. Now, are there any standard questions that you like to ask management and directors and the technical team? Because I know you attend conferences and there's a lot of fluff. <laughs> well, there is a lot of fluff, as we both know, Maurice. Um, I have a uh, company evaluation template that anyone who is a subscriber to my website, a uh, uh, free email subscriber, uh, so the price is right, you can send me an email and I will send you the company evaluation template. It's uh, four or five pages long and there's lots of questions on it. Uh, at the end of that, there's three or four favorite questions that I commonly ask uh, uh, the CEOs, the management. Uh, one of them would be, uh, for example, uh, under what Lot most likely scenario would cause your company to fail. Uh, if, a, if a CEO does not have a good answer to that, he probably hasn't really evaluated his own company. Uh, another question would be, uh, uh, what have you not told me that I need to know? Uh, another one would be something like, uh, you are competing with 1,200 juniors for my speculative dollars. Uh, what makes your company uh, one of merit of the few, let's say, 30 or 35 that I hold amongst those 1,200 companies? So those are kind of the, the tough questions at the end of an evaluation. Those actually are very good questions. Uh, I'll have to use those as well. Finally, Let's discuss the project. Well, one of those I borrowed from from our our uh, friend uh, Bob Moriarty, and that's uh, the one about uh, uh, what have you told me, not told me that I need to know. So uh, <laughs> you can imagine Bob asking that question, right? I can certainly see him asking that. Well, uh, let's discuss projects. What criteria gives you confidence in a project? Well, uh, I am involved in juniors with a variety of projects, all the way from grassroots exploration to small miners. Uh, so there's a number of criteria. I want uh, a good geological setting. I want a good geographical area with infrastructure uh, or the ability to build out infrastructure that uh, that without rendering the project uneconomic, I want a good geopolitical jurisdiction. I am increasingly uh, cognizant and tend to shy away from areas with what I perceive as high geopolitical risk, uh, for instance, for resource nationalism. I want to go into an area uh, that has uh, or a country that has a mining history uh, and understands mining 
I want to make sure that uh, there are not the radical NGOs that will oppose this project, et cetera, et cetera. So a number of things, an infinite number of questions that, that come into mind when evaluating these companies. And conversely, what is just an automatic red flag for you? I think geopolitical risk is is the thing that that scares me off more than anything. Uh, you know, we've seen this uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, Tanzania changed their mining law. Uh, the De Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, has uh, uh, changed its criteria. South Africa has. Uh, proposed new black empowerment rules. Guatemala has shut down Tahoe's uh, mining project in that country. So uh, I am very uh, uh, fearful. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word or cautious when it comes to geopolitical risk and as a result I tend to only play if you will in countries that I consider to be stable uh, with a great understanding of the rule of law and uh, with uh, no ability to change the rules in the middle of the game. You know, Mickey, on behalf of all of our listeners, we are most appreciative of your efforts and sharing your wisdom throughout the years. Before we close, what last word of advice would you like to share with listeners? Uh, in the junior resource space, beware of frogs masquerading as princes, because there's a lot of those. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> now, Mickey, if someone listening wants to get more information about your work, Please share the contact details. Uh, I can be reached at contact at mercenarygeologist.com. Um, the website is mercenarygeologist.com. Free subscription service. I run a sponsor model. So all my content, including my stock picks, is available to my 6,500 subscribers. And uh, you can join 63,000 Twitter followers at Mercenary Geo. And last but not least, please visit our website, www.provenandprobable.com, where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenandprobable.com. Mickey Fope, the Mercenary Geologist, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.